But we're talking about the most brilliant mind this world has ever seen. See, see, see. Welcome back into the Brian and Brendan talking about Beaver football podcast. Things are going to be changed up a little bit right now. Brendan is not joining me for this podcast, but lucky for everyone else, we got my good friend Warner Strasbaugh on the podcast, former editor, former reporter and daily barometer hall of famer now working as a sports reporter down in Yuma, Arizona for the, for the Yuma sun. Warner, glad to have you on. How's it going? Yeah, thanks for having me. I don't know if uh, everyone's lucky that I'm here, but you know, if they need something to listen to on a car ride, I'll I'll, I'll provide some info. Hey, we get close to a hundred listens on these podcasts, so a hundred people are lucky. We'll say that. Nice, nice. Those are those are good numbers. I I imagine those are better numbers than the podcast that Andrew Kilstrom and I did when I was back there. Maybe I don't know, but yeah, we've gotten pretty good turnout. So. Like I said, you know, super, really excited to you know have you on. We've been trying to do this for weeks, like might even be pushing a month at this point, and finally figured yeah, out. How, it was after the Idaho State game. Yeah, after the Idaho State game, that seems like, well, about a month ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, Warner, you know, obviously, you know, worked for the Barometer. You covered the Oregon State team from 2011 through 2014, correct? Mm-hmm. All right, so your first year was the three and nine year, and then you ended when, well, when you basically were gone when Mike Riley like left. So, you, yeah, yeah, the first, the or not the first, the last article I wrote was uh, from Gary Anderson's press conference. Yep, I I remember I was sitting right next to you on that day of of uh, Gary Anderson's press conference. Mm-hmm. So yeah, where I'm, you know, so we'll talk a lot about Mike Riley just because I mean he's kind of you know, kind of blowing up in, in Nebraska. Now they're top 10 team off to a, off to a bowl start. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Mike Riley and kind of his time here and love to get kind of your insight and why, you know, things like, because for, for you, even though, you know, they went, you know, they won nine games in 2012 and, you know, went to the, uh, went to the Alamo bowl. Then they went, you know, seven wins and then didn't make a bowl game. Uh, in 2014, uh, Sean Mannion's senior year, and then that was uh, obviously Mike Riley's last year. So, you know, while all this was happening, you were still a big – is advocate the right word for for your uh, – def- Defender. Defender. Probably the most proper word. All right, so you remained a defender of Mike Riley even through all that. Why were you a defender of him? Um, I just – you know, I think – Mike Riley's legacy will end up being that he kind of got the best out of, out of what he could with, with the situation he was in. I think, um, I just think he got a lot of knocks for some, I guess, tactician from a tactician standpoint, just because of his in-game management or the way he, you know, managed his quarterbacks, like in the Mannion cat situation and then the Mannion Baz situation um, and obviously they, you know, sort of fell apart and he was loyal to his coaches. And I know we're going to get into all those subjects, but I think the main thing was, is just honestly, I think he was a lot better than people realize. I think expectations are a pretty big factor when it comes to people's points of view on coaches or just on anything in life, like a movie. But um, the fact is that Riley's last four years, the four years I covered the Beavers were also Number one, they were the best four years for the Oregon Ducks. So I think that played a lot bigger of a part in this than anyone would think, just because the success that Oregon had sort of raised the level of expectation, I think, for Oregon State to try to at least stay competitive with the in-state rivals. And, you know, he he found a lot of diamonds in the rough. He just, I think he did a good job, and I don't really know. <laughs> How else to describe it? I think it would be better once you start asking questions for me to give better responses than just a general overview. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll definitely get more into them. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, just for transfer, just for transparency purposes, you know, I was, you know, when Riley decided to leave for Nebraska, I thought it was a good move for Oregon State. 
Um, I did think that the program was becoming a little a little stale, maybe where they weren't they weren't very competitive in the in the Pac-12 as they were, say you know 2012 and and before that. Um, I I always like likened it to uh, like Terry Francona when he left with when he left the Red Sox, like he had you know had a ton of success with Boston winning winning two World Series and all that, but he like once he like left that job is he. He said that, you know, it's just time for, you know, this clubhouse to have a different voice. And I thought that was what like Oregon State needed. They needed a different voice within their within the football program. And, you know, it worked out. He went to a one of the like blue one of the blue blood programs in college football and is obviously <clears throat> in year two of his success of, in year two of his uh, tenure there is, uh, you know, has them already in the top 10. So. It, it seems to have worked out for for him. Yeah, and and I mean to be clear, I I do kind of agree with with your your assessment and kind of a lot of people's assessment that things were stale, that things were stagnant. I mean, I think they kind of were. You know, it was the same coaching staff for a long time, and I think the argument that a break for both sides was needed is is totally valid. I think my main my main defense of Riley from this standpoint is that if Oregon State screwed up the next hire. Not that I'm saying Gary Anderson is a screw up because there's still plenty of time for that to be decided or not. But just that it's, it's very easy to fall back into being a complete bottom feeder in the PAC 12. And that's kind of what I thought is that this was sort of a big moment for Oregon state that without Riley, I think it would be a lot harder for them to succeed. Yeah. And we're already seeing, uh, you know, a year and a half into the Gary Anderson era that, you know, just to, just because it's a new coach doesn't mean things are going to instantly turn around. I mean, he went won two games a year ago and is currently has two wins this year. He got his first Pac-12 win last week against Cal. But, you know, you see a lot of kind of. You know, when you're when you're evaluating coaches, you, you tend to like maybe like overanalyze like the school that you're like that you follow. It, it, it happens across the board. Every, every fan's like probably, you know, more critical of their school and, you know, have this, you know, gr- the grass is always greener on the other side kind of approach. And I think that was, <clears throat> uh, that kind of became true for, uh, you know, at, at Oregon state where, you know, you see all these other programs like Oregon and now that like who are, you know, getting better while Oregon state just kind of, you know, remain the same. Mm-hmm. And so, I completely forgot where I'm going with this. I just, I started talking, and now we're gonna just. So yeah, so I think you know we're seeing with the, with Gary Anderson that, you know, it's it takes a lot of time to kind of you know build a program into something that's good that you know Mike Riley had. I mean there's, I mean and you know you know they're playing for, for back to back Rose Bowls and you know unfortunately you know they didn't, they didn't finish it. But, I mean they're they're like a very very competitive program. And you know, right now we're not quite seeing that at Oregon State. They're not. <clears throat> they're not a continu- They're not a very competitive program yet. There's still a lot of things kind of that they have to overcome, and I think that was kind of those things that Mike Riley overcame. I think often got get overlooked. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. You know, don't don't worry about it. I talked myself in circles on my first answer and felt dumb <laughs> about it too. So. It, it's going to happen. This is kind of not, not totally, uh, you know, I, I don't have my notes in front of me of exactly what we're talking about, so it's, it's fine. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think it does take time and I think that's clear. And one point that came up when you were talking in my head um, that I should have made early, which is kind of the main reason I think Mike Riley was good for Oregon state is that recruits came to Oregon state a lot of times, because of Mike Riley, because, I mean, honestly, one of the biggest knocks against him is that he's too nice. But from my experience talking to incoming freshmen, a lot of people like that about him. And that's, you know, they felt comfortable with him. They felt like that sort of family vibe and just that, you know, good old like grandpa kind of feel like that was something that was a good thing. And their family liked him. And, you know, I'm not saying that that was the only reason, but I just think a big reason of why people came to Oregon State was because of Mike Riley. And we saw with how many people decommitted when he left. Um, and I think a fair amount of them went to Nebraska, right? Yeah, there, I think there was 
I don't, I don't have the exact number down, but there's definitely there's definitely a few. I I can I can recall definitely two. There's a there's a like outside linebacker type, and then there's like a tight end that you know went went to Nebraska with Riley, and so yeah. Um, I I mean I think just kind of in col- within college football, a lot of the times that they are just like committing to a coach. I think that's. Uh-huh. I, I I would say that's you know pretty standard across across the board is that you know a lot of these players they're coming you know for football and you know going to the coach that like kind of just like shows them the most love and you know who they feel comfortable with so I, you know playing a little bit of like devil's advocate I I could say that that's you know something that's ha- that that happens across a- across the country uh, when Anderson came to Oregon State I think he brought I think one or two recruits with him from from Wisconsin and so. I think that's just kind of that's just something that happens is that players commit more to a coach than to a school. Is that fair to yeah. say? Yeah, no, that's a fair point. And and I think uh I mean I think just the other main thing, and this is something that we've talked about a lot, um, off off the podcast obviously, but that you know, Riley sort of had had a very big understand like it just I think what I'm getting at is just the level of like how personable he is. Mm-hmm. Um, that sure everyone's coming to a coach, but if Riley is offering this kind of you know atmosphere, which I imagine is kind of rare. I mean, I've said this before. I feel like Gary Anderson's a pretty generic college football coach, just as far as his demeanor and just the way he sort of um, you know just handles everything. I mean, he looks like a college football coach. He talks like one. I mean, he's he's just kind of you know your bread and butter with football coach, but. I feel like Riley offered something different than most coaches would um, would be offering. So that's kind of where I feel like he did stand out um, to counter your counter. No, yeah, and I think that's that's very valid. I I can see kind of the uh, like the cookie cutter, you know, form that Anderson takes. He's he, like like you said, he looks and talks like a football coach, and and I think yeah, and Riley definitely presented something definitely something different because he's definitely more of that you know laid back just like ah oh, shucks we didn't get this win <laughs> yeah and, like he's like your uncle or your grandpa or your dad you know yeah and, and 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 that's a good point so i guess we can we can jump into some of the you know kind of mike riley's biggest criticisms i'll take mm-hmm. the stance of like I'll, I'll basically playing devil's advocate with you warren i'll just be like well Riley was this and he obviously couldn't do this. So the first one I have Mike Riley, he was too loyal to his coaches. Um, Well, yeah, I, am not going to argue against that because I think that's completely true. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the one, the one thing, uh, this will probably be the only one that I'll agree with the the typical anti Riley person on, but what shocked me when he went to Nebraska was that I kind of, (laughs) I mean, this was just my, my half-baked idea, you know, in the moment, but I kind of viewed it as a way to sort of get rid of his coaching staff without mm-hmm. actually, like, firing people, so that he would go to Nebraska and he would have this this platform to bring in some really good talent for a coaching staff. Not that Langsdorf and Banker aren't talented, but just that he would have the ability to, to get a kind of higher level of assistant coaches, you know, get – get a bunch of guys who are on the cusp of becoming head coaches that are ambitious, that are going to do a great job for two years and then bolt and then just sort of recycle that. So I was kind of shocked when he brought over virtually everyone from the staff um, just because that was sort of the way I stood on it. Um, yeah. I mean, he's absolutely loyal to his coaches. I think that sort of plays into to what I was just talking about with his sort of um, personal level and sort of his non you know, his not intense college coach, uh, demeanor, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't really put a good argument with that. I mean, I think they've had a lot of success and I think at times at Oregon state, it looked outdated. I mean, they, you know, offenses were changing left and right in college football from, you know, about two, well, based, I guess from 2005 to 2015, but more in sort of the chip Kelly era just that sort of quick change quick pace spread offenses and Oregon State seemed to be pretty slow to adjust to that and that would be I'm specifically talking about Mark Baker when I'm saying that mm-hmm. no I, I 
I, I I agree with you on that. I do think that he he held on to people too long, especially especially like kind of someone like Mark Banker, who I mean, there's a time Mark Banker was one of the you could say one of the top defensive coordinators. He Oregon State was having some of the nation's you know top defenses. They led the nation in run in run defense one year, um, but then like Oregon, their offense started becoming really explosive, and he couldn't stop them. But you know that's fine. Oh, no, no, one, Washington. yeah, yeah. Um, so no one was stopping Oregon. They, Oregon's offense was ahead of ahead of its time. Not ahead of its time, but it just like people didn't know how to handle it and didn't know how to handle I, like the I tempo. Mean, I think it was ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At but, least they were the, the first to do that. Yeah. Sure. But usually, like when I say something like, "Oh, he was ahead of its time," like it would work like in the future, but it like didn't work then. It, it's like the the run and shoot like in the NFL. Oh right, right. So like it like Scarface ahead of its time. Yeah, no, I get what you're yeah. saying. But and so like fine, you can't you can't stop Oregon. No one was having success doing that. But then he started just getting his defense started getting gashed by the the Eastern Washingtons and the just some of the the teams that shouldn't be putting up huge numbers on your on your defense. And so like by the time like the you know 2013 season was going along. I, I think you know we had like conversations about this back then. It's like, man, is is Mark Banker gonna <laughs> is he gonna be able to continue? Is Mike Riley just gonna be like, you know what, this this isn't working out? And so I, I do think it is it is a fair comparison, uh, a fair criticism of Riley saying he held on to people too long, especially someone like Mark Banker. But but hey, Nebraska they've got a they've got a pretty de- defense decent defense going on in Lincoln right now, so. Maybe, right. Maybe. Yeah, and I mean that's that's the other thing is that if any big conference is going to suit that coaching staff, it's the Big Ten. Oh yeah, I, I think it it was just a good move for him because that you don't see a ton of spread the, that up tempo offense, and, and and also I just think the uh, uh, defense are a little more equipped now to handle those spread attacks that Oregon was was bringing on. You know, in the right, and it also could be a. It could be a matter of personnel too. I mean, if if Oregon State was trying to plug guys into their system that weren't exactly up to stuff to do it, whereas at Nebraska they probably have their pick of guys that they they want to fill in those roles. So that might be another thing too, is just a personnel standpoint. Yeah, and here here's a here's a half baked theory for you, Warner, if you're if you're ready for it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. I think Oregon Oregon State's defense when they were like really good. I think it made like Oregon change its offense because oh. yeah, I think that because Oregon's defense, like when they were like in those kind of like 2005 to 2009, those like yeah, uh, four so years. Talking when, like when they brought Gary Croton in at Oregon. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it made Oregon change because Oregon state had the fast defense. They were the ones that, that that whose speed was causing a problem, so I think it made Oregon get faster, and find ways to better mm-hmm. utilize that. I have no data to back that up or anything. It's just something I've just thought about. Yeah, no, I, I mean I think that's fair because yeah, it was because I was obviously living in Eugene, um, and yeah, I mean I can I remember when Gary Croton came in with the spread offense, and that was when they had Dennis Dixon at quarterback, and actually I think the first year was still with Kellen Clemens at quarterback, mm-hmm. but uh, obviously he wasn't a runner like Dixon was, but yeah, I mean, that that would, as far as cause and effect goes, that the timing would work out for your half-big theory. Well, I'm, I'm glad you can get on board a l- at least a little bit, Warner. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think there's, there's a little to that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if Oregon State's defense could impact someone's entire decision making in the way that Oregon's offense did to everyone else. But I, I think there there's something to that. I mean I remember who was it, Cameron Colvin that they recruited. He was a big speedster around that time. hmm All right. But anyway, yeah, it's interesting. I, I feel better about that that theory then. <laughs> Alright, so here, here here's the next criticism coming at you. Mike yeah. Riley doesn't develop talent. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't get that one. I think there's, there are numerous examples of developing talent over the years. I mean, well, what specifically, I guess, do you mean? 
like from freshman year to senior year, they don't get better? Or do you just mean that yeah. the talent's not there to begin with and nothing comes of it? That players are not improving in their time at Oregon State. So fr- fresh, freshman to senior. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I just, just in my, in my time there, I don't, I don't think that's valid at all. I mean, you look at Brandon Cooks and his ascension, Sean Mannion. I mean, obviously it's a little different since he was the quarterback and he was playing as a redshirt freshman, but Sean Mannion was horrible as a redshirt freshman here. And by his last two years, well, definitely his junior year, but, um, you know, he was, he was pretty insane. And obviously he had Cooks, but those mm-hmm. can kind of bounce off each other as both being developing over time. Yeah, and then you look at. Uh, I mean, you look at what Marcus Wheaton turned into. Um, you know, I guess in my time there, the running, the running backs and the offensive line never really got any better or worse. Well, they just got injured, but yeah, I don't think um, the. Go go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, just on the, I'm just thinking on the defensive side. I mean, look at a guy like Rashad Reynolds. Yeah, that, that's uh, a great Jordan example. Boyer. I mean, those were two guys who were quarterbacks who came in and didn't play a whole bunch. And then their junior and senior years were pretty phenomenal. Uh, Scott Crichton was a guy who played right away and was really good right away. But by his junior year, I mean, he was unblockable that time. So I don't know. I, I, I don't see any, anything valid with that one. Yeah. I mean, me neither. Uh, I think Rashad Reynolds was a, was a great example. You, Cause he played, he was kind of forced into action as a sophomore when uh, Brandon Harden went down and then right. he, he got picked on a little bit. And then like towards the end of his, his, uh, that, that his sophomore year, he was like, okay, this guy can play. And then he had a really good junior year, uh, opposite of, opposite of Jordan Poyer. And then, you know, senior year, he was definitely the kind of like the leader and the, uh, like he, he covered all the, all the best players, his, his senior year, all the, all the best receivers. And yeah, and here, here's the thing. Like, here, here's another thing I've been thinking about. Like, with about Sean Manning. Like, obviously his numbers were not as good his his senior year as, as opposed to his junior. Year. I, I mean, he lost Cooks, and you know, early in the year lost Richard Mullaney. But mm-hmm. his receivers were Victor Bolden, a sophomore, a true sophomore. Yeah, Jordan Villeman, who was at the time was basically a, a true freshman because he wasn't able to practice the year before because he was dealing with academic things. So like that was like his true freshman year. And then, right. Right. Very raw Jordan Villeman too. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then Hunter Jarman was, was kind of that, that, that third guy. And right. We were, right. And we were like really high on like those, like those three at the time. It's like, man, that that's a good core. And, yeah. And like today or, and like uh, up to, up to, up to now those guys like really haven't done anything <laughs> like i mean bolden he, yeah he's, he's pretty I mean, good bolden's really the only one who's like playing a lot right yeah like villaman he has less than 50 yards on the season hunter jarman yeah like, no that is and, and like hunter jarman this i mean he he scored a touchdown today which was which like isn't surprising because like he had a good he had a good you know wretched freshman year and you know we kind of expected this but he like hasn't really seen the field at all this year and so it's just like how how good was Sean Manning able to get make those three right and so yeah I still think yeah I, th- I think Sean Manning also needs- oh, just one other one other guy I wanted to mention um, from my time there was Andrew Samalo I mean he was a walk on who really. I mean, you know, walk-ons, it's, it's hard for them to get time. And by the end of his senior year, he was a captain. He was starting to send to tackle, and he was, he was pretty good. good at it from, from most accounts. I mean, I'm not even going to pretend I can analyze defensive tackle play, but people said he was good. That I trust, so I believe that. Yeah, he was a little undersized. He wasn't going to have a, an NFL career, but was definitely a, a key cog in that defensive line that, you know, in 2012 was – was a pretty good defense line. They they played the run pretty well, and I mean, with, with Crichton and Wynn coming on off the edges, like that was a that was a solid front four. Mm-hmm. But I, I'll just finish my my last thing with Sean Manning. I think his I think his senior year is now, you know, now that we're seeing the the play of the wide receivers and what he had to deal with. Um, 
his senior year when they were all freshmen, I think it it makes his senior year look better than what it actually was. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, yeah. and uh, wanna, I just I want to be clear that I don't I don't think all the guys we named Mike Riley is solely responsible for their development, but you know people make blanket statements saying he can't develop players, so I think it, you know that also falls in with the assistant coaches and their roles in that too. I just wanted to make that point. All right, so you ready for the next one? Let's do it. I mean, Mike Riley won some games, but he just couldn't win the big one. Mike Riley can't win big games. Yeah. Um, I mean, it depends on what your definition of big games is. If your definition is beating Chip Kelly two years in a row um, in two, well, one and a half close games, then no, he couldn't win those games, but they were close. And they, I, I definitely think the one at Autzen in 09 was pretty winnable for Oregon State. I mean, that came down to the end. Mm-hmm. And just kind of one play that that turned the tide at the end. But I mean, they beat USC twice when USC was a complete juggernaut. Um, you know, they beat and they beat Cal when Cal was number two, um, right? But what about those non like mid two thousands? Yeah, but what about those non conference games? Like they got thumped by LSU. Well, they didn't get thumped by LSU, but thumped by Penn State. Louisville. I mean, yeah, I mean, those were, those were like top 10 teams at the time. I mean, that was, that was one of Penn state's better teams. Um, my, my half of my family's Penn state people. So I actually had quite a bit of interest in that and I follow Penn state. So that, that was a really good Penn state team and all those games are on the road. That Louisville team. If I remember that was like the Brian Brom, Michael Bush, Louisville team, right? Yeah. Like, it's weird. They they schedule these games like, and some of them are against like like a Louisville, like not not a national power. I mean they're, I mean they've had some good seasons recently. I mean Charlie Strong did a lot of good things for that program. Their quarterback is it Lamar Jackson, who's like scoring like yeah. six touchdowns a game. Like, mm-hmm. I think when they schedule those games, they, those weren't the, the they're expecting. Oh, Louisville, just a nice basketball school that you know also has a football team. And then yeah. the, the year they played, like ended up being like really good. The same thing happened with uh, Cincinnati when they played them. Like Cincinnati went on to play in the, I think it was the Sugar Bowl against Tim Tebow in Florida, and it's, and like the Penn State, they went on to, you know, play in the Rose Bowl against USC, which would have been, <laughs> which would have been an interesting game because if Oregon State had beaten Oregon in 2008, they would have played Penn State in the Rose Bowl, which would have been a very interesting storyline from you know getting yeah just getting like ran off the field to yeah well and I, I think i remember that penn state game was kind of like a last minute scheduling wasn't it uh I... like that was that wasn't one of the i i'm pretty sure that wasn't one of the ones that's like seven years in advance i think that happened like the year before yeah that that could very well be it i i, I can't say for certain yeah, I I don't know. I well, first of all, I I admire Mike Riley for being willing to do that because, I mean, a lot of teams, particularly in the in the Big Ten, just refuse to play good opponents in the non-conference, um, and I think that's changed a lot more lately, just because of how aware everyone is, and just with the internet and analytics and all that, there's there's a lot more going into the rankings other than you know. 20 years ago when a coach would just say, Oh, they're six and I'll put them at, put them up there. And, you know, just basically go down the list of records and big conferences. So I think it's changed, but I think back in the, the time that we're talking about 10 years ago, I mean, a lot of teams just never played good opponents. They would play FCS schools or one double A at the time. And I just wanted to say, I admire his willingness to, to do those games because I think there is a lot of good that can come out of them. Even if you're, expecting to lose um but back to the main question i mean i don't know i i know that the oregon games sting more than the other games as far as those big losses go but i mean just in our time i mean think about the 2012 year and how many big wins there were i mean they beat three ranked teams to open the season um and then you know they, they petered off a little toward the end but and the Arizona State win in Manion's senior year, that was a pretty big one. So, 
yeah, I mean, obviously they never went to a national championship or competed for one um, in, in Riley's time, but I, I think the amount of big games they won versus lost isn't enough to, to sway me either way on that. But I, so I would say that is, is an invalid argument again. <laughs> yeah, no. And I mean, they, they went to play at like LSU and they when LSU is coming off a national championship and yeah, I just think, you know, after they played those games, they seem to, I guess, I guess like the one exception would be the, uh, when they traveled to Wisconsin and, you know, the Russell Wilson team that was, you know, two Hail Marys away from playing the national championship. Um, the, the, the team just seemed to get better throughout the year there. There was definitely progress and they ended up, you know, finishing the team. They, they ended up finishing pretty well. And I think if they had, you know, played again at the end of the season, the games would have been a lot closer. Right. And Hey, I would even argue that after that Wisconsin game, they did get a lot better. I mean, the Sacramento State loss and the Wisconsin loss were easily the two worst losses of that year, just as far as like impact goes. Mm-hmm. I know they weren't necessarily by point differential, but I mean to lose at home to Sac State and then lose, I think it was thirty five to nothing at Wisconsin, which that I mean that game could have been sixty three to nothing if Wisconsin wanted it to be. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they came back, Manning got better. I mean, it was a really, really young team. Yeah. Um and, you know, they got three Pac twelve wins out of it. So I, I think they got a lot better after that too. All right, here comes the next one for you, Warner. Mike Riley just can't recruit to Corvallis. Yeah, um, I mean, on the surface, that's probably true, because. But I think it's a small part of a bigger issue, which was kind of a lot of the narrative from me and from a lot of media members that a lot of fans didn't like, but that it's not easy to recruit to Corvallis because I mean, I, I feel like from, from my time here, cause I am covering a, a pretty high end junior college mm-hmm. school. So I know this isn't exactly the, the high school recruiting scene, but just, just from my experience with the junior college guys, which by the way, both the two guys that I've talked to you about yeah. that are at Arizona Western are both now saying Oregon state is their favorite. So, Oh really? Uh, I don't, I don't want to read too much into that because those guys change their minds every day. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that's that's kind of beside the point. Yeah. But oh. they they lump Pac-12 schools as a group. So if they are getting looked at by multiple, you know, they just Pac-12 is a thing. It's not a specific Pac-12 school. It's the Pac-12. So then when you go there and you break down the Pac-12, what do you got? Okay, you have Oregon. Everyone wants to go to Oregon. Sorry, Beavers fans, but it's just they have all all the resources and they have all the appeal for young people. Um, everyone wants to go to USC. I mean, that's a huge legacy. That's always going to be kind of, I think, the West Coast pillar as far as like old time historical greatness is mm-hmm. going to be USC. You have UCLA, which is another history school that's in Los Angeles. You have the two Bay Area schools, uh, which are both, you know, if anyone wants to get an education, I don't know how many football recruits do at the time they're being recruited, but a lot of them do. That, that plays a part. Um, and you just look at the cities. I mean, Seattle, Bay Area, LA, I mean, these are all appealing cities. Mm-hmm. Oregon State and Washington State are the bottom two. Um, well, I guess of of the ten, I guess I I kind of forget that Colorado and Utah are in the conference, but those are kind of off on their own. But just as far as the the original Pac-10 schools go, they're the clear bottom two. Just as far as appeal in terms of location, in terms of history, in terms of national spotlight, I mean, I, I think that's pretty clear, right? Yeah, and and I'll even add something. I I, I agree with you know what what you're saying. I think there are you know definite definite hurdles that. Oregon State and Corvallis have to jump while other ones don't have to. But I'm also going to add that Oregon is not a huge hotbed for for recruiting talent. Um, I mean, Oregon State, you know, it's not a very big state in terms of population. So there's just like not a, a high number of recruits. And so that, you know. Right. Yeah. There's hardly any in-state recruits. Is, is, I mean, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Not, not, not a lot. Or just of, the appeal of, of the Oregon in general. Uh, just not a enough legitimate Pac-12 uh, ready to compete, you know, on the, at the Pac-12 level 
type right. talent. I mean, there there are some. There are a couple that kind of break the mold and stand out. I mean, Isaac Samalo, you know, one of them is one of them, obviously, who was, you know, a big time recruit and, you know, came in and made an immediate impact. I mean, Thomas Tyner. And mm-hmm. the, I mean, there, there, there are examples, but those are like more outliers. A lot of the, I feel like a lot of the uh, <clears throat> recruits that come from Oregon are, are like tweeners between like, you know, they could, you know, play it. Eastern Washington or they could play at Oregon State just kind of not that definite Pac-12 talent is that is that a fair assessment right yeah yeah and just the, the depth isn't there I mean yeah there are, there are definitely some high-end guys here and there but it's just the depth isn't there I mean I don't take you know the rivals rankings too seriously but I mean just the national level of Oregon recruits is never there. I mean, you look at the state ranks and then they're like national ranks and the guy who's the number two cornerback in Oregon is the, you know, not even ranked. He's not even in the top, however many cornerbacks they rank because mm-hmm. there are so many from other states. So yeah, I just think the, the depth from Oregon is, is non-existent and there are, there are occasionally some high end guys, but few and far between outliers, like you said. Yeah. And, and I also think that Mike Riley was kind of a, a creative recruiter. I think he, you know, found, found like athletes that and and players that are different from a lot of people. Like he was, you know, one of the first yeah. to use kind of that that really like kind of small, quick receiver. You know, on the on the in in terms of the running game with the fly sweep when you know James Rogers got here, um, mm-hmm. his, his running backs were always like always seemed small but could you know get things done. He's found pl- he, he's he's found just like unique players that could contribute and found, found ways to make it work. And I think that's, I think, you know, Gary Anderson is kind of, you know, running into some of those same problems, you know, right now is just finding enough, you know, people that want to come to Corvallis. Cause I mean, he had a couple, you know, blue chip prospects, you know, you know, sign on, on a national signing day, but then ended up not being able to, to get in academically. And so, mm. Just kind of some of the same issues that Riley faced. I think Anderson is facing right now, and yeah, and so yeah, I don't buy that the Mike Riley couldn't recruit. Now I do think recruiting kind of took a dip a little bit in his. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I also think a lot of that has to do is with uh, facilities. Other schools were upgrading theirs. Oregon State wasn't. So. You know, each year, I mean, the Valley Football Center got older and older and older. People are busting out new ones with, and they're like magnificent facilities. Like, I mean, Oregon's is like just grossly awesome. <laughs> like, that's, yeah, it's it's outrageous. Yeah, and like Oregon's not the only one. Like Washington State just recently redid theirs, and Mike Leach, you know, said, "Oh, they're they're better than Oregon's," which that's just Mike Leach, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, the facilities part always fascinates me just because, like, for me, I mean, obviously, <laughs> I was not, not a recruit. But if I were a recruit, it just it wouldn't matter to me that much. I mean, you know, I'd want something capable. Like, mm-hmm. if I got injured, I would want a really good medical staff and, you know, places to go to heal, obviously. But just, like, the the extravagance of it all is what just kind of blows my mind. But I know that that is an enormous factor. And yeah, Oregon state was kind of last in the conference for, for a while with that too. Yeah. And now, you know, one of the things I find that's like pretty like interesting is that, I mean, Mike Riley basically, you know, did all the, the fundraising for the, uh, for the new Valley football <laughs> center. And that the, the day, the, the day that I, they announced that, the project's happening happens to be the same day that they hire Gary Anderson. So I do expect a, mm-hmm. an uptick in the recruiting from Anderson that could be just cause he's a, a good recruiter and is a charismatic leader and is able to get those players. But then on the other hand, it could be that, Hey, Oregon state up, upgraded its facilities and it's, it's able to attract coming kind of those, uh, you know, higher end, you know, pack 12 players who, you know, we'll see Oregon State's facilities as more as an equal than a completely lopsided. Mm-hmm. All right. You know, Mike Riley, he's, I mean, he's fine and everything, but he, he's just too nice to be a football coach. What do you think about that, Warner? 
Uh, I, I feel like I already gave my answer to that, but I. Uh, we can keep it. Brief I just then. I don't buy it. I don't. What? I said we can keep it. We can keep this one brief. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I just I don't buy it. I I think. I think sometimes people need to kick in the pants, but I think with Riley's staff, it didn't necessarily have to come from Riley. And I feel like when it did come from Riley, which I, I witnessed plenty of times at practice, I mean, he's very calm and collected, but when he, when he kind of snapped, it was, it was a big deal. Mm-hmm. But just with the coaching staff, I mean, Mark Banker fits into that generic college football coach who's going to yell like a drill sergeant. Mm-hmm. Mike Cavanaugh, the offensive line coach, Definitely. he was like that. I mean, they had those guys who could play those roles, and I just don't feel like college athletes and college football players who are starting in the Pac-12 have to have that to be extra motivation. Um, And also, like I said before, I feel like the niceness played a positive role in in the recruiting. Um, So, you know, I get it. I mean, I think that's something that's very easy to point to when – Oregon State loses a big game and, you know, maybe Mike Riley punted with six minutes to go in the fourth quarter and everyone wanted him to go for it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of plays into that whole persona. So I I, I just feel like that's kind of a scapegoat with Riley. And I don't really think that's an issue in general because there are plenty of football coaches who are nice. I mean, I always compare Mike Riley to Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy is considered to be like one of the nicest guys in the world. He won a Super Bowl. He won basically 12 games a year every year with Tampa Bay and Indianapolis. Um, so I just I don't totally get that, and I think it's just kind of uh, something for Oregon State fans to lean on when they're mad at Mike Riley. Yeah, and so if if uh, Tony Dungy's uh, Mike Once Riley, here, then uh, then that means that uh, Gary Anderson's uh, gosh. John Gruden, God, why is it, why did that escape me? Yeah, John Gruden, and <laughs> and let's see. Yeah, no, that's definitely. I mean, in our in our failed attempt at the podcast a few weeks ago, that that's the analogy that I brought up because it was kind of the same scenario in Tampa Bay. Mm-hmm. The fans were sick of Dungy. They're sick of him being kind of meek seeming. And then they bring in, yeah, the ultimate sort of hard ass who, can I say hard ass? Sure. Fine. (laughs) Um, You know, that, that's going to be the drill sergeant. That's going to be, you know, working from 4 a.m. to 1 a.m. every day and then sleeping for two hours. And I mean, John Gruden's a great coach Mm -hmm. and he did win a Super Bowl the next year, but like with um, Mike Riley, you know, Gruden just basically had all of Dungey's players when he did it. And, I think Gruden does a great job or did a great job. He's not coaching anymore, but I also think he had a lot of help with what was left behind from Dungy. Yeah. And I guess that's where this comparison kind of ends is because now that they're, I I mean, one can make the argument that, you know, Riley, you know, bolted for Nebraska and, you know, maybe that he knew that the talent maybe wasn't quite there. I I don't know how I feel about that. There's, there's definitely some weaknesses on this team. There's, um, you, you know, in our last failed attempt to, to do this podcast, um, you know, we, we had touched on that, you know, 2015. So last year's season was headed towards kind of one of those you know, like three and nine type years oh, yeah. anyway. It was, it was doomed no matter if it was Mike Riley or Gary Anderson or Tony Dungy coaching it. They were, they would have gone three and nine at best regardless of the coach last year. Yeah. So, so anyway, yeah, I, I don't think Mike Riley was too nice. I, I just, I think he was who he was, and I think that's what you need to be. I think you just you can't be who, some someone you're not. And I think he was he was like kind of open about that he, when he would, because he would be asked about you know, oh why are you so nice, Mike? Why are you like some, by some of the, like the national media when they would, you know, come to an Oregon State game or or whatnot? And he's like you know I'm just being who I am. This is who I am, and I think that that ended up working pretty well. He he's he's had a pretty nice career in in football by being too nice. Yeah, yeah, and I just think that transparency works, and I think trying to be someone you're not isn't going to get through to players either. So, All right, and then here, here's the final one. I mean, Mike, right. Mike Riley did a lot of great things, but he could not beat the Ducks. Yeah, 
no argument from me there. He couldn't. <laughs> I mean, they, they did for a while. They traded wins for a while, but, I mean, no one could beat Chip Kelly stock. Yeah. I, I, like, I don't think that's... What was, do you know what his overall record was against Oregon? It probably it, would have been, like, what, 5-8 and eight or something, 4-9? and nine. It was... I believe it's 4-10. and 4-10. And and but he lost the last seven. So he had yeah. at one point he had a winning record and then Chip Kelly happened and yeah Chip Kelly set the college football world on fire and made every team look foolish and parlayed that into a into an NFL job where he won back to back he had back to back 10 win seasons so yeah yeah i mean i can't argue with that. I mean, it's mostly a fact. Obviously, he did beat the Ducks at some point, so I guess that's my argument is that he could beat the Ducks because he did. But no, I mean, Oregon was better than Oregon State in every single one of those years. The only, the only year I really thought they had a chance in at my time with the barometer was uh, 2012 because it was at home, and that mm-hmm. was definitely Oregon State's best year in in that time. And uh, yeah, and they were in it for a while, and then. Mark Sweden fumbled that punt and uh, Devin Kettle. everything broke loose. Yeah, gosh. What, I, what what I do remember about that game is like coming out of halftime, Sean Mannion led this, you know, nice drive, you know, cut it to a, I think it was like a, I think it was, he cut it to a one score game. And then by the time he yeah, got I think, the, I think it was 20 to 17, wasn't it? Yeah. So, something like that. And it's was like, oh man, Th- this this could really happen, and then by the next time, you know, Sean Manning got the ball back, they were down seventeen, <laughs> and he's yeah. having to throw. Uh, that changes the game plan completely. Now you're having to throw a little bit more to to try to make up time and and all that, and then the interception started happening, and then the wheels fell off, and they lost by like twenty four or something like that. Right. But yeah, and then 2013, almost almost gosh, almost pulled that crazy that crazy went out you know with you know Victor mm-hmm. Bolden but then Marcus Mariota did Marcus Mariota things and yep <laughs> uh, what a gosh that was that, that, that was a rough game to watch I mean it was really exciting but the, just that ending was so heartbreaking yeah yeah it was I was looking at the 2012 game it was um it was 20 to 10 at halftime mm-hmm. but I think it was 20 to 17 let me see Yeah, yeah, it was twenty to seventeen with ten minutes to go in the third quarter, and then let me just read this scoring drive for you right now. Okay, DeAnthony Thomas touchdown, DeAnthony Thomas touchdown, Kenyon Barner touchdown, Marcus Mariota touchdown, um, and yeah, and then it was forty-eight to seventeen. Yeah, it just the, the wheels had fallen off. Uh, there was, I mean, Wheaton had dropped the punt. Got to make sure I get the right. Devin Kell uh, muffed the uh, like a squib kick. And yeah, tough game, tough game. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, he, he couldn't beat Oregon. And I don't think that had anything to do with Mike Riley. I imagine, well, I guess it's not quite the same because Oregon's not as good anymore, but I was just going to say, I imagine Gary Anderson will have a tough time against Oregon too. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, I mean, last year lost by, by 10 had a, had right. a pretty decent showing, but I mean that Oregon that Oregon team had some serious flaws to it. De- definitely weren't the Oregon teams that um, that Mike Riley was facing in the in the, the later years with Chip Kelly, and they were just you know putting up fifty points on everyone. So yeah, mm-hmm. I do have one final question for you, Warner. Okay, Ryan Nall. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hopefully someone listening has seen our Ryan Nall exchanges. It's you know it's really too bad. I know I become the new Chuck Norris joke. It I I'm I'm putting in the effort to make it happen, but it's really unfortunate when he had one carry today for 32 yards and then got injured. Gosh, that's just Ryan Ryan Nall's gonna end up just being a tragedy for us. I I I'm I, I'm fearing that might happen. Because, man, that that Cal game yeah, was. It came out of the last game too, right? <laughs> yeah, and and it left Cal early after having like two hundred and fifty some yards. Just 
on 14 carries. On 14 carries, yeah, averaging averaging 16 yards a carry. And yeah, Ryan Nall, just a he 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 falls into that unique player that Riley would recruit because he can I mean he's he's a really good running back, but you know, going into the Civil War last year, you know, before the Civil War, they were gonna like move him to linebacker. But yeah. then he then he blew up in the Civil War, so they decided to keep it running back. So just another one of those another one of those just unique players that Riley was able to find. And now I mean Anderson and the team's kind of, you know, reaping from those ben- from those from that work. So uh, I mean I'm mm-hmm. not not gonna blame it at all. Uh, that might have, you know, seemed like a shot at Anderson and his and his staff, but no. Like Ryan Nall, really, really fun player to watch and it's a shame that he's that he's always injured because he's, you know, like you said, just he's just a fun player to, to to talk about and have exchanges with. All right, yeah, so I, nothing else to say. Ryan yeah, Null. Ryan Null. The the answer to everything. All right. So I think we're done talking about Oregon State football and Mike Riley. I think we 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 put a nice. We 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 talked for gosh nearly an hour about that so. <laughs> hopefully people are, are are still liking it so yeah this is gonna be this is gonna be like a vintage bs report with bill simmons that it just goes on and on and on yeah. and it's definitely not gonna be as good but it's still gonna exist yeah it, it, it'll be so, someone out there will like it i hope because yeah this thing is just getting started <laughs> <laughs> well yeah now now that we've already spent so much, much time on it we have nothing to lose i mean if we were if we we're gonna keep it at a certain time. That that's probably not gonna happen anymore. No, because we still got it. We we got to talk Michael Conforto, and then we're gonna talk a little about a little bit about your uh, about the history of you and Brom. I have, I have a couple questions for you about your time here as a as a reporter for the Barometer and covering Oregon State athletics. Okay. All right. So th- th- there's not a lot to talk about. You know, Michael Conforto. Are the Mets using him correctly? You know, they're moving him to center field. They're saying he's going to play first base. He's he's all over the place. What's up with Michael Conforto? <laughs> <laughs> you follow baseball? Yeah, cool. I, my, yeah, I've, religiously. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I've I've switched twice on this now. So <laughs> at the beginning of the year, three times. So at first, I thought they rushed him last year when they called him up because they were just in total desperation move mm-hmm. um, and, and they were, you know, around 500 and they had just gotten Cespedes and, and they were making their push and he was destroying double A. He was only a year out from the draft and they called him up. I mean, I was excited about it, obviously, yeah. but it was way, I mean, it was just way too soon for him, but he came up and he delivered. I mean, he was really, really good. Um, so at that point, then I was like, "Well, hey, it looks like a good move." Mm-hmm. Uh, then at the beginning of the year, you know, he he had established himself; he, he was going to be the starter. But they straight platooned him, which just isn't something that you really, really want to do. A platoon for the non-baseball educated means that left-handers only hit against right-handers; they never hit against left-handers, and vice mm-hmm. versa. So they did that, and um, he crushed it in the beginning, and then they started playing him every day. And then he started sucking against lefties, which I guess proves the point that they shouldn't have been playing him against lefties. Mm-hmm. But then once that kind of happened, then just the wheels fell off and, and he struggled really hard and got sent down and they kept him down. And I thought that was a good move to keep him down. I thought he should stay at AAA, but then he hit like 500 in AAA and they brought him up. I think he got called up and back twice. Yeah. And then they decided he was going to be a center fielder, which doesn't make sense. <laughs> because he couldn't play center field in college. So I didn't really understand why they thought he could play center field at City Field, which is a pretty big park. Yeah, Michael Conforto just doesn't, um, sorry, he just doesn't strike me as someone who, you know, can just like defend the center field very well. Just doesn't seem like the guy that has like the speed to do it of of a Jackie Bradley Jr. Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the Red Sox in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, he's, at the college level, he was a very good defensive left fielder. At the major league level, he's an average left fielder. Mm-hmm. I He didn't really play center very much, but I'd imagine if he did, he would be a very, very below average center fielder. So anyway, long story short, I flip-flopped a lot. Right now I'm saying 
Uh, they're not handling him well. So now they're moving to first base. I think they're just overwhelming him with all these changes. And I think when it comes to Conforto at this point, he's not a regular in their lineup. Like he's either going to be a bench bat or he's going to be in AAA next year. Mm-hmm. And they're throwing all this stuff to like let him play and let him develop. And then once that happens, then move him to first base. But I don't, I just don't see the benefit in him spending this entire offseason learning to play first base instead of just like getting his head straight because he really struggled in baseball's mental. And obviously that, that played a large part of it. It was just because they keep slinging him around in different positions to AAA, back to the majors. And I just think that it was kind of overwhelming for a young guy who's still only, you know, two and a half years removed from being drafted. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I follow baseball pretty closely, you know, not half as much as you do, but yeah, I, I, I think they're just moving around too much. I, the, I mean, if there's a position they're going to move into, first base, I think is one that can work, but he hasn't played like infield. Like I know, like he, I know he played like in, in high school, but he, he rarely played in the infield at, at Oregon state. If ever, do you, do you, do you ever remember uh, him playing it in the infield at Oregon he, state? He never did. I, I remember he never did. I think he played third base in high school because there was a time, and I forget which year it was, but I think it might have been his last year. So the third base would have won Hamilton. Yeah. Philip Hamilton, right? Yep. My to- yeah. Okay. And I think he got hurt. And I think they were considering playing Conforto at third or just at least getting him time there as like an emergency third baseman. And it was like getting close to – to postseason time, but he never did in the game. So, as far as I know, he never played infield in the game. Crazy, yeah. The, I mean, like Hanley Ramirez. Sorry, I'm just gonna just throw another you know Red Sox comparison in here. I mean, he. <laughs> <laughs> I'd throw in A's ones, but no one would know who I'm talking about. Yeah, because I mean that 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 roster changes every year. Warner, you can't. Not everyone can be an A's fan, and just stay on top yeah, of that. No, you probably. <laughs> I, I've been out of Corvallis for more than a year now. You probably only know like five players on the A's at this point. Yeah, no. Th- th- there was a time I knew their their bench players, their their yeah, <laughs> their whole rotation. You, their... you were a big Craig Gentry fan. Oh, that, that left-handed hitting or the right-handed hitting platoon center fielder was your guy for Lo- a, for a team that, <laughs> that's not even your favorite team. Oh, loved him. <laughs> he he laid down a perfect drag bunt once, and that that sold me. But anyway, yeah, like, number three. yeah, well, anyway, yeah, and, and the number three, but yeah, Hanley Ramirez, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Red Sox moved him to left field, played awfully, just, just, just a terrible left fielder. He made, he made Manny look good. Yeah. He made, he made Manny Ramirez look good, which, which is hard to do. And then yeah. I thought the move to, and they moved him to first base this year. I thought was a, just a great move. You know, from the start, because he because he did have infield experience at the major league level. He was a shortstop. He played third base. I thought that'd be a much smoother transition, and it ended up paying off pretty well. I mean, it could have been just he. I mean, he started hitting better. I don't know. <laughs> like you said, the the game's so much uh, has. There's a lot of, a lot of the mental side of it, and yeah, he was able to. He got a swing back, you know, hit, you know, had over 100 RBIs, over 30 home runs. Was it was really good to put it shortly. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and with Conforto, they're just, I mean, they're just thinking in the short term because like first base is a pretty weak spot for them. I mean, James Loney it was starting for them at first. Like Lucas Duda kind of had an injury, played year. So I think they're just thinking in the short term. They're thinking. We have no long-term answer at first base, so let's put Conforto there because our outfield's fine right now. And I just you can't think like that in baseball. Yeah. Well, it, it's a it's a real bummer, especially after I mean he was, you know, w- once he you know moved up, he was so hot, and then he had a, you know good postseason, you know, went yard off off Granky and and twice. Then, uh, twice in the playoffs. I keep forgetting that it, that it happened twice, and then this year was just just came out hot you know this year and was <laughs> and got compared to his like first 70 <laughs> games compared to mike trout and bryce harper you know to the no, better stats all the way around <laughs> better stats but then after that it just the wheels fell off you know obviously you know someone that we want to see do do really well 
just because, I mean, obviously the Oregon State connection, you probably know him very, you know, pretty well and all that. So it's just kind of a shame to see how things are going with him and with the, with the Mets in his second year. Yeah, when a year from now when Michael Conforto wins the Silver Slugger for first base in the National League, we'll have to do, a, do another podcast. Oh, yeah, and then just talk about, oh, the Mets are brilliant for moving him to first base. What? <laughs> Why didn't they think of this sooner? Always thought he looked like a first baseman. Yeah, yeah, he he ha- he has the build for a first baseman. I, I'll I'll give you that. <laughs> um. All right, Warner. One one last baseball question before we get into some of your barometer, the barometer history, and kind of rehash some of that stuff. Sure. What's your What's your favorite David Ortiz moment? um can i pick none no i'm just kidding um i mean you you can't really argue against game four of the alcs in 2004 i mean that's it's about as good as it gets yeah no but i was uh talking to you know what, what one of my one of my friends and like of the you know top like 20 moments of my life he's he's in there for so many of them or at least like at least four yeah so yeah game four game five um and 2013 world series he hit like 636 yeah and then i mean he didn't the boston strong speech yeah the boston strong like just just watching that now just still just like still just like gives me goosebumps just that he's able that that's what he did, and it's just awesome. All right, enough about baseball, Warner. Let's talk about your time at the Barometer. I mean, you started off as a reporter, your sports editor, editor in chief. What is the one thing yeah. that you remember about, or that you like cherish about your time with the with the Barometer? Um. You know, it's actually, this answer isn't really geared toward uh, sports fans, but I guess if any, any of your coworkers at the, at the barometer are, are listening, then this would be for them. But uh, it was, it was the year I was editor in chief. You know, I had to, I had to take a step back from reporting. I still did like a weekly football column and I still cover the baseball team because I'm a lunatic, Mm -hmm. but it was, it's, it was just sort of the day to day. Like we had uh, Megan Campbell. She was our news and managing editor. She was kind of the, the number two and just, you know, working with her on the day to day. And, you know, we worked really, really hard to try to establish a, a good news section because that was kind of the one thing I wanted to address because I feel like sports was in a good place. And we had Andrew who had already done it for a while. And yeah, I mean, it's just sort of the day to day and, and, kind of finding these few people who are crazy enough to do this job with us. And, you know, Oregon state doesn't have a journalism school, so Mm -hmm. we have to be the teachers. Like we're essentially the journalism teachers. I mean, anyone who's coming up who's interested in this has to look to their editors to tell them what to do or how to do it. Cause a lot of people that apply and come in with an interest in this don't know what they're doing. I mean, I didn't, I remember my first time I read a bunch of just game stories from, people I had looked at to just figure out, you know, what I was even doing. Mm-hmm. So it is just sort of to sound really cheesy, which I, I never really sound cheesy. I hate when I interview people and they <laughs> give me cheesy cliche filled answers, but yeah, it was just kind of the, the team element of it. And just that five days a week we were building something and it was something that we felt like was relevant to Oregon state students and even to Corvallis as a community. No, yeah, that's that's a great answer because I, it, it's kind of, you know, one of the things that we're kind of going through with right now with kind of this new position where, you know, I'm doing a, you know, daily kind of news, like three minute news video with, you know, several different stories is still just trying to find people that are, you know, crazy enough to, to want to do this every day. And yeah, so that's, it, it may sound a little cheesy, but I dig it. I get, I'm, I'm on board with it. It's not that cheesy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, there were probably about 25 of us, but we were, I mean, there were, you know, five editors and about 20 different reporters doing different things. And we just, we all spent a lot of time together and we all 
we're working towards something. And, you know, there are different levels of commitment. Obviously, the people on the editorial staff care a lot more for the most part. But it was just, it was fun doing that and and uh, feeling like what you're doing mattered. And that's why I love this profession. <laughs> Well, very good. So we'll 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 gear this now more towards a little bit bit about sports. So you know, because sure. this, this is a sports podcast, and I mean, you're a sports reporter. You were a sports reporter for the Barometer and sports editor for most of your time, and still, you know, obviously still very involved with with sports as your time as editor in chief. Mm-hmm. Who was your favorite interview, player, player or coach? You know what? Who was your favorite player to interview, and who was your favorite coach to interview? Okay. Um, player was Ben Wetzler. He, uh, he was really interesting. You know, he went through kind of two pretty tough, um, things in his senior year. Well, not tough, tough, but just adverse, you know, obstacles. Mm -hmm. He had the signing bonus debacle with the Phillies, which I don't, really want to get into too much but you know he basically got hosed and the Phillies like kind of called him out on it and um and then he drunkenly punched a window to someone's house that wasn't his so that's his fault but uh he was just very interesting he was like totally goofy and had this weird sense of humor but he also like he always sort of kept things very real when you interviewed him like he a lot of guys particularly on the football team you know they kind of are coached to how they should answer questions Mm -hmm. but you know Wetzler would talk about stuff and obviously I'm a big baseball guy so I would ask him those kind of inside baseball questions as you know as a pitcher and a lot of times those were things that weren't for articles but just just for conversation for me to have kind of yeah exactly um and yeah I mean he was interesting he was he was the leader of that team. I mean, he, and most of all, he kind of cared more than anyone on that team. Not that the other guys didn't care, but he just was in it so much. And like, I would wear A stuff and he would yell at me because he thought it was duck stuff. And <laughs> like, he was just a fascinating guy. And uh, yeah, he was fun to talk to, uh, especially from being a big baseball guy. Yeah. All right. Now, what, what about, what, who's your favorite coach to interview? Um, that's an interesting one. I mean, it, it might be Riley, but, you know, one of the things I liked was covering the, the smaller sports or basically just the non-football sports just mm-hmm. because I, I only had maybe four, like, one-on-one type interviews with Riley in my entire time there. I mean, it was usually a big media circle. Mm-hmm. I mean, I liked interviewing him, but um, I don't know. Definitely – not Pat Casey. He was he didn't like reporters that much. Um, and he was a great coach. I mean, yeah. I, I liked Pat Casey, but he just wasn't a big fan of, of talking to us, especially after losses. Yeah, I, I know all about I don't that. Know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's kind of tough. Well, I'll I'll, t- I'll tell you my favorite. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll think about it. So I was actually. It is actually, you know, the first beat I was on. I I really enjoyed uh, Steve, Steve Simmons. Simmons. Yeah, I th- yeah, that's, I was kind of thinking that. I just didn't cover them that much. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I didn't know a whole lot about soccer going it going into it, or even like reporting or whatnot, because <laughs> I was, you know, very. I'd never done anything like that before, and he was just very. He, he's very thorough in his answers, and you know, did a really good job, you know, describing things to me, and you know, helping me learn. And he was one of the coaches that if I wanted to go into his office and like do an interview with him, he was like always open for that and would, you know, kind of, you know, help me, help me kind of understand the game better. And like, even to this day, he's still like, if we like cross paths and say, Oh, Hey Brian, how's it going? And so as that was, so for me, Steve Simmons is like still one of my favorite, one of my favorite coaches to interview and just, just kind of talk to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think he's disqualified just because I didn't cover them for that long. It was mm-hmm. only, it was basically a month. I was kind of filling in for someone, but yeah, no, Steve Simmons allowed me to do what I always wanted to have an excuse to do, which was to talk about the premier league <laughs> in a, in an article because I was talking to him about it one day and I was asking him if he was into it and he, he was very, very into it. I mean, he was very knowledgeable about the premier league. Mm-hmm. So I thought it would be fun to do like a, you know, 
what Premier League team should you be, you know, according to Steve Simmons. And he would kind of give, you know, the the different answers. And I remember talking to Will Seymour, who was a defender uh, for the Beavers, and because he was from England and he was a Manchester United fan, and talking to him about that. So that was pretty awesome because I always wanted to somehow work the Premier League into anything that I could do. And I think that was the only time I ever did. Um, you know, I'll, I'll throw a wild card at you. The Ooh. assistant gymnastics coach, I covered gymnastics for two years, yeah. Michael Chaplin. Uh, just a great guy. I mean, he was fun to talk to. He's a great interview. Um, and he was just, yeah, I mean, those smaller sports, you know, the barometer is the only one that covers them. Football, basketball, baseball, they get covered by most of the media outlets in the state. But um, the small sports, you know, they, they really appreciate the coverage in a way that, you know, you get with like prep sports. So I always found that interesting. And yeah, Michael Chaplin's my answer. Yeah, Michael Chaplin, that's good. I, I mean, I've interviewed... Uh... Uh, it's it's Tara Chap Chaplin. Tanya. So, yeah, Tanya. Yeah, she's the uh, gymnastics coach. I've interviewed her a couple times, and she was you know kind of the mm-hmm. same way where she would, you know, <laughs> explain explain the sport to me as someone who just doesn't watch gymnastics other than during the Olympics, and even then it's maybe just like a couple a couple meets. And so yeah, it's all it's always nice with those uh, you know lower you know not the football, basketball, baseball sports that. You know, they're all very, you know, willing to kind of, you know, t- like teach about their sport a little bit as well as mm-hmm. as give you kind of information about those things. Yeah. And for any uh, potential sports journalist listening, gymnastics is the most underrated beat to cover at Oregon State. It's great. They're yeah. really good and they're like great interviews. I, I had a blast covering them. And it's just it's super interesting to me to go into a sport that I know nothing about and try to like do my best to figure it out. Cause I mean, well, you know how I am. I'm kind of, you know, kind of crazy when it comes to, to figuring stuff out. So just a little, that, that was a lot of fun <laughs> for me. All right. What was the, what was the most awkward interview you've had or aw- awkward moment in an interview that you've had? It could be like a question that you asked that you didn't get a good response. It could be just an interview that, you know, went terribly wrong and, or just something like that. Um, gosh, well, the ones I'm thinking of aren't like one-on-one interviews, but it was, it was super awkward. Okay. So I told you the last article I wrote was Gary Anderson's presser. Yeah. And this just kind of shows how my career at the barometer was defined by the Sean Mannion era. The first article I ever wrote, um, for covering football was an article about Sean Mannion taking over for Ryan Katz Mm -hmm. because that had already happened, you know, into the because the barometer comes out like three weeks into the season. So Mm -hmm. it was, I think after the Wisconsin game, but before whatever the next game was, that was the most awkward thing I've ever experienced was being in the group of, because there were a ton of people had come like other people that don't cover the Beavers every day came like, you know, the Portland TV station came Mm -hmm. um, because of the quarterback controversy. So there were like 15 people just circled around Ryan Katz after He's basically having to tell everyone that he's lost his job and he's pissed about it and trying not to come across like an a-hole, but also not really faking that he's, he's happy with it either. So that was, that was a pretty awkward, like first time doing a a football story place to be. Oh yeah. I, I, I imagine. Um, I think maybe, maybe my answer, I don't have a specific answer, but I definitely, uh, question some of Casey's tactics at times and he didn't like me doing that so that might have been the most uncomfortable for me personally oh yeah no uh Pat Casey he's uh I've gotten a one word answer from him I think twice now <laughs> just ask a question he's just like no <laughs> and so <laughs> like those are awkward but yeah one of them just like just recently happened it was with uh Brenton Brennan was one of, one of my most like I guess, I guess awkward or just kind of like, Oh man, how are you going to zing me like that? But I was asking the question, just like, <laughs> are there anything like specifics? Like you want this receiver to work on? And he's like, it's like, I can't, I can't say that. But Colorado could be listening. Come on, man. You know better than that. <laughs> and I was like, come on now. You don't need to <laughs> just asking for a little more, a little more information. No need to, but he, like he, he, he was cool about it and, and whatnot. And that's just kind of the, the guy he is. So. I guess yeah. I guess that's what I get for being a little too nosy. Yeah, yeah it's hey, it's your job. Yeah. 
All right. Now I'm going to steal this question from from Josh Warden because, you know, before we you know, were recording this podcast, you know, a nice and long conversation with Josh and, you know, Josh from when you're from your time with the barometer, he's yeah. he, he's an OK guy. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I take I take like five percent credit for all his successes because I don't think he ever would have written for the barometer if it weren't for me. Yeah, no, I, I actually was a. Uh, Cause I was, I was, just t- I was talking about that, you know, we're going to be recording this podcast with you. And he's like, Oh, you know, Warner's here. I'd love to see him. I was like, Oh no, we're going to, I'm going to call him in on, on Skype and whatnot. And he, and then I was kind of, we were just, you just kind of came up and I was like, yeah, no, Warner was just, cause he, he said something like, Oh, I wasn't a very good writer when I first started. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. I thought like, like Warner and Andrew were like really impressed with you at least early on and whatnot. And that, and then I kind of like told you, like told him the story about, about when uh, you two called a game together, like way back when, mm-hmm. and then yeah, and, my lone radio appearance. Yeah, and and the funny thing is, he had his laptop and he pulled up that game, and we were <laughs> we listened to some of the calls. <laughs> oh my gosh, how bad was I? You weren't very charismatic. I'll I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> You're just like, oh, okay. I was very charismatic. No, you you weren't very charismatic. Okay. Yeah, you were just kind of well yeah because he told me to do play by play because i i was just doing this as like a favor mm-hmm. like i just i thought it'd be fun they needed someone and uh our old advisor asked me to do it but yeah uh, I, I thought josh was gonna do play by play i was like <laughs> how am i gonna do play by play i've never done this i thought i was just gonna be like the commentator yeah and so that's <laughs> like that's what yeah we just pulled up that and it's like yep sean Mannion. oh he fumbles the ball oh but he's able to pick up the first down and just like things like that it's just like you, I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah, you you, you could kind of you could kind of sense that there. You didn't command the the microphone like that. Yeah, I like, think that Josh I does think now. That was, um, yeah, no, Josh. Josh is a pro at, at radio. Um, yeah, no, because I had just gotten back from my internship, literally like two days, two days before that game, and then Kate, our old advisor, was like, "Hey, there's this." freshman who's like really into doing radio and he needs someone to do this with and i was like sure <laughs> and now look at he's like he's a you know top flight writer now now that he's uh that you you know brought him into the barometer and got him into writing and he's really good yeah no he he impressed me that's my my play-by-play blunders were, were worth it because we got a, a pretty good reporter out of it and I think he was just going to do TV and radio and I had to kind of nudge him into doing the barometer. Well, nice. That, that That's good. So I guess now we'll get to the question that Josh asked me today when we were kind of talking because we had, we, okay. we, we, we talked, we had a basically a conversation that we have like all the time where we just kind of just like talk about journalism and you know, how, how things are, are going and like what we want to, what, what we want to accomplish. And so the question he asked me was like, if you could go on a road trip, with any player that you've covered, who would it be? I mean, it, it's it's kind of maybe answers that first question, but is there a difference, or would you want to go on a ben, uh, road trip with Ben Wetzler? Who would you want to be? Um, who would you want to be stuck in a car with? Well, I mean, yeah. So this is just like a friendly, non-work related thing. Yeah. Um. Boy, that's. I don't know. I don't think it'd be Wetzler. I think we would probably not get along after a little while. <laughs> um, you guys just two big personalities. Yeah, but it probably would be a baseball guy. I mean, is am I doing this like, am I in a time machine and I'm at Oregon State doing this or am I doing this now with like what has followed for those athletes? Hmm. Like you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Yo, look, am, look. am I going on the trip tomorrow and Michael Conforto has played for the Mets for a year? We'll, we'll we'll go athletes like when they're at Oregon State and when you were at Oregon State because yeah like okay. mm, I mean Wetzler would still be interesting yeah I mean it would probably be a baseball guy just because if we're on a road trip and we're talking about baseball that's going to be great so I mean Wetzler or Conforto would be up there Andrew Moore seemed like a pretty cool dude yeah um, you know what maybe 
maybe maybe I'd just risk it. Maybe I would go with Wetzler just because I feel like the the conversations we could have would be fun. And he was like so blunt about everything. And if we're on this road trip and he's off the record with everything, it's going to be 10 times better. So, yeah, same answer. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's a good one. Just there, there'd probably be times where you like would both of you would like, you know what, don't talk to me anymore. I've <laughs> I've had enough. But yeah, yeah, no, he he'd probably he would definitely be way more annoyed about the whole scenario than I would. Like he would be like, why is this happening? Why is the world <laughs> decided to make this happen? It's like, no, I don't want to be on a road trip with Warner. <laughs> punch, punch out, punch himself out of the window. <laughs> that was a cheap shot. Yeah, it was, it was funny. Yeah, that that was tough. Uh, so when Josh asked me that question, I went with with two people. I, I went with I went with two football players because, I mean, I think you know football still like my probably my favorite sport. And I still am you know really fascinated with you know just like you know people talking football. And so I went with I actually <laughs> did go with Jordan Villeman just because I think he's a I think a road trip with him would be a lot of fun, just because he's just kind of a fun spirit and it'd be entertaining. And mm. then I went with a uh, Gabe Ovgard just because, um, that's probably the athlete that I probably know the the most about and probably like know the the most. That I mean, I didn't know him prior to anything, but just like getting to know him through, like reporting and whatnot, he just seems just like a really. A dude that I'd want I'd I'd want to I want to hang out with, so yeah. I mean that he I also. Uh, go ahead. I just I think I might have an amendment on mine. I think I might go with Obum Guachum, who I totally forgot about. Oh, oh, I, you know what's really funny? Um, last week he was he was at the OSU game, and I was on the field as the you know players were running, you know running up onto the field out of the locker room, and I look behind me and there's Obum Guachum just like towering over me <laughs> and yeah so Brent, brandon cooks was also you know at, at the game and brandon cooks got this you know he got you know brought out onto the field and was like you know announced everyone and just like everyone just like cheered like why didn't why didn't oh boom get any love where, where, where was the love in yeah. that yeah oh boom was a great a great story well he was I mean, the reason I say that is because he was my neighbor. So he was probably like the one athlete that I knew that I knew personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rest of them I knew through reporting, but I, I mean, he was, he was our neighbor. We, we had run-ins and if I needed something quick, you know, he would be my guy and he was always helping, but I just think he was a great story just because he was viewed as pretty much an overhyped failure for yeah. <laughs> three years as a receiver and then switch to defensive end and turn out to be incredible. And it just makes me wonder what would have happened if he would have played defensive end the whole time. He probably could have been a first round pick. Yeah. Cause he's definitely has the, uh, like you said, the physical abilities. I mean, he was this <laughs> massive wide receiver, just like Megatron sized and just couldn't figure out how to ca catch that ball, which is, you mm -hmm. know, which is pretty important when you're playing wide receiver. <laughs> it is. It is. But yeah, no, he's, he was definitely one of the nicest guys I, I met at my time at OSU, not just at the barometer, but just in general. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's all I got for you, Warren. I'm just okay. so I'm so stoked that we we're finally able to do this. We'll have, we'll have to do yeah, it. Hopefully it works. Hopefully it works. Hopefully we just didn't just waste <laughs> ninety minutes like we've done. Is is this our th second or third attempt? I think it's our third attempt. Oh, uh, it's our second time, like actually recording Talking, but it's our third time trying yeah so you know what they say third time's a charm i mean we've been talking for you know about the average length of our of our phone conversations actually you know maybe even a little bit shorter so i don't know I, f I feel a little i feel like we should be doing more but i feel like we've we've hit a nice ending point with this podcast what do you say yeah 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 I'm, I'm with you we can we can talk fantasy baseball off, off the air <laughs> Oh, yeah, we, we definitely need to do that because I feel I, I feel disappointed about that. But that's for an entirely different conversation that people probably don't want to, you know, be 90 minutes into a podcast and be like, man, when are they going to talk about fantasy baseball? Yeah, no, they've just been 
on pins and needles waiting to hear about the, the Pine Tar Keeper League. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, if you made it to this far into the podcast, you know, thank you so much for listening and continuing to listen to, you know, the Brian and Brendan talking about Beaver Football podcast. It's, I guess this is technically our eighth episode, even though Brendan's not here. Thanks again to Warner Strasbaugh for joining us and taking time out of his busy schedule to to, to chat just about Oregon State. We talked some some baseball, and then we will be we'll be bringing out more podcasts on. We'll we'll bring on more guests. We'll we'll Warner will be we'll we'll be, yeah we'll bring Warner back on at some point. We'll maybe get some <laughs> other people. But anyway, thanks again for listening. We'll be back at it again soon. I'm